Hello, everybody, and welcome again to ChessLecture.com. This is International Master David Garrido. And today I'm going to show a game that I recently came across um, that's just a, a month or two old that made me recall a really classic game from 1985 uh, that John Nunn played. And it's a game in the Samish Kings Indian that Black won that's very well known, well, to me at least, and I think to maybe a lot of uh, old-timers like myself, because 1985 doesn't sound so long ago to some of us. But this game really surprised me because White lost the game really without a fight, um, simply due to ignorance of this other game. And so even if he didn't know the, that this game was like a real kind of classic uh, King's Indian game, at the very least he just didn't know the theory of the line. So, you know, I think any time you study an opening, like, it's really good to know, like, some of the, the great games in the opening. So if you're studying the King's Indian, even though it's not hot theory, you know, it's still good to know, like, some of these great games by, like, Kasparov or Fisher and maybe some non-world champions like guys like John Nunn, who's really, you know, one of the, the top players back in the 80s. So let's take a look at the game, and I'll talk about the opening a little bit on the way there. It's basically a miniature that Black wins, and you know the game had already been won the same way before. So d4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7, e4, d6, f3, the Samish, castles, bishop e3, and now knight bd7. So there's other moves I've covered uh, on our site before. I've covered the classical e5 and a uh, you know, a few years ago in a series of lectures on like kind of a simple repertoire for black. And I've also covered the piano in, in some games, including some of my own games. Uh, this move, knight bd7, is kind of tricky. I've actually played it myself a few times. It's flexible because black can play c5 or e5, depending on what white does. So here, white plays queen d2. There's other moves that are also possible, like... You know, knight ge2, oops. And even knight h3 is a move. Though the point of knight h3 is if black goes for a Benoni setup like this, then this is a very good square for the knight because it's out of the way of the light bishop. So if it goes to e2, it has to move again to, you know, c1 or g3 or something in order to make way for the light bishop. So f2 is a very cozy square, overprotects the e4 pawn. And also the g4 square, so it will make it easier for white to eventually play f4. So usually against knight h3, black will then switch and play e5 and go for that kind of setup. So we can see the flexibility there. So queen d2 is played in this game, c5, and now white played d5. Another way to play would be to just uh, play knight e2, because there's not so much pressure on d4, because black's knight has gone to d7 instead of c6. Um, now let's say a6. Castles, this is another kind of neat line. Queen a5. King b1. b5. So black's getting his stuff going. And now after knight d5, this move looks very annoying because if, if queen takes d2, then knight takes e7 check. This is a well-known theme from the, the the dragon, Sicilian, various Sicilians. You know, once white plays king b1, because queen t2 is not checked, knight takes e7 would win a clean pawn. And queen d8 looks pretty depressing to have to retreat. But here black has this amazing move, knight takes d5. And if queen takes queen, knight takes e3, it's the rook, rook c1, and knight takes c4. And black has uh, two minor pieces and a pawn for the queen. Uh, white could play rook takes c4, but then black will just have, like, you know, decent material. And this uh, has actually scored quite well for, for black. It's uh, famous from a game, uh, Bobotsov Tal, from uh, 1958. So if anyone is interested in seeing that whole game, that's the line. Um, white has also tried, after 95 CD, and I actually had this position myself once, and this was thought to be better for white at some point, but after queen takes... Rook takes, you know, white is hoping, you know, to have some kind of, you know, uh, like a good space advantage here, you know, weak square on c6, maybe rook c2. But black doesn't have to take on d4, and instead f5 
gives black very good counterplay. You know, maybe he'll take on e4, then d4, and then his own knight can come to e5. So this actually has, has worked out pretty well uh, for black. So in our game, white played d5, which is also very natural. So now black's, you know, uh, in a Bononi structure, black is usually going to try to get e6 in. But now that would hang the d6 pawn. So knight e5. And now white has a little trouble developing because knight h3 would be bad because if bishop takes h3. And if he plays knight to e2, then that hangs the c4 pawn. So he can't do that. So white would like to play f4, but then knight to g4 will gobble up his dark bishop. So white has two choices here. And... Um, Probably the best move is bishop to g5 with the idea f4. And this makes black strategy a little risky, but it's risky for white too. Like after like a6, f4, knight e d7, knight f3, and like b5, and we get some kind of uh, Banco Gambit. You know, uh, both sides have lost a little time. Black with his, his knight going to from d7 to e5 and back, and white with his bishop, and also playing f3, f4. So this is pretty unclear, but it's probably a more critical way for white to play. So the other move which was chosen in this game, which probably just doesn't really work, is h3. So this is kind of an ugly looking move, but f4 is threatened, so if e6, f4, knight has to go back, and then just d, e, f, e, d6, and black doesn't have anything to show for the pawn. So black has to take very concrete measures, and black has to be bold, and that's what happens in the king's in eyes. You have to find a way to make things work. So knight h5. This is a logical move to try to highlight the problems with white's last non-developing move. So now if f4, just knight g3, and now, you know, for h2, you just take on f1 and then take on c4 and black wins. So fe, knight h1. And this is probably good for black. The knight, it's not so, it's not so easy to get the knight out, but it's not so easy to trap either because black's going to do like bishop takes e5 and then the knight can come out. So it just doesn't really work. So white has to cover this square. Bishop f2. Now he's once again ready for f4. Really, he's ready for f4 and g4. So, you know, if e6, like f4, back, you know, I mean, white maybe could even, like, play, like, g4, push both the knights back. And even if he doesn't go pawn grabbing on d6, you know, he'd have a lot of space. Um, but maybe this is this is playable. Maybe white can do, even do g4 first. That might even be better. The knight has to go back. And now maybe f4 doesn't really look like it should work for black. Because there's not really a good way to open the position. So black has to strike. F5. So this is a good move, because now if F4, this is this really strong move, bishop to H6, simply attacking the F4 pawn and pinning it. So if G3, just F takes E4, now, like if knight takes, then we can sacrifice already with knight f4, like gf, and maybe like rook takes f4, which hits the knight. And uh, if the knight moves, we can still play like rook e4 check and then take the queen. So that doesn't work for white. So instead, white takes on f5. And now rook takes. This is the key. So black really has this very harmonious position. All of his pieces are very active. But g4 is going to win a piece. So, but this is a case where, like, rook takes f5. It looks like the right move. It's active. Now, now maybe even, like, knight f4 is a possibility. Uh, or maybe rook f4, which would attack c4. So the test is g4. And now another great move. Um... You know, if we play if we play knight takes f3, then knight takes, rook takes, gh. And it looks like maybe black has some compensation, but he really doesn't, because uh, black's king side is pretty open. White can castle queen side. He's just going to gain a tempo on this rook at some point, too. And black's down a piece. 
So black plays the spectacular move. Rook takes f3. All right, so he can't take on f3 because just knight takes check, wins the queen. So he's got to take the other guy. So he does g takes h, and another really strong move, queen to f8. The rook is still untouchable. And this move, just by putting pressure on the f file, makes it very hard for white to develop. And, you know, he can't cast along, not only because f2 is hanging, but there's another idea introduced, bishop to f8. So all black's pieces are flowing in. And this had all been seen way back in 1985 in a game of John Nunn. And there white played uh, knight e4, bishop h6. You know, there might even be uh, other strong moves like, uh, like queen f5 here. But bishop h6 is also very good. Queen c2, queen f4, knight e2, and then clever rook takes f2, because if knight takes f4, rook takes c2. So knight takes f2, knight f3 check, king d1, queen h4, Knight d3, and uh, bishop f5, tying white up uh, quite a bit. So you play knight e to c1. And now a, a funny move, knight to d2, just kind of blocking white up. And, uh, you know, black won in a few moves. This is already kind of lights out. You know, he's, uh, he's already threatening to take here. And then do knight e3. So this is a game, Believsky Nun, from 1985. So our game took a little bit of a different course, but a lot of similar ideas. White played what's technically the best move, I guess. Uh, he played rook d1, but it's still not enough to save the game. And uh, this had actually occurred once uh, before, and black played an uh, inaccurate move, bishop h6. And this does, just doesn't really work now because, you know, even everything's like lots of fun, but you have to still calculate and, and check things. And he played queen e2, and now black has trouble developing the initiative. He played queen f4, uh, bishop g2, and now he's really just losing material because the rook is essentially trapped. You know, he did like rook takes f2, queen takes, queen takes c4. And uh, then, you know, White got himself together with, like, knight f3, and it just didn't really work. So um, that was a rare game where White did not lose in this line. So there's really only, uh, after rook d1, it turns out there's only one really good move uh, for Black. But in this game, Black managed to find it. He played bishop to f5. So he's just kind of gunning on the d3 square. And now White played queen e2 and lost pretty quickly. Um, probably the best thing to do is this ugly rook h2 just to kind of overprotect the f2 bishop. And then after bishop h6, queen e2, bishop d3. This is the thing that's hard to see from a distance, but the way white can still fight is to get rid of this knight. Queen takes e5, d e and bishop takes d3. So white at least has, you know, some kind of reasonable material situation with three pieces for the queen, but probably black can, you know, still keep the initiative by sacrificing further rook d3, rook d3, and then queen f5. So now the queen has all kinds of, you know, places in here, and like rook f8 is still coming. Um, you know, the, the rook can't go to d2 either because the bishop on h6, so it's still pretty... Uh, pretty bad for white. He's just so poorly coordinated. So here he played queen e2, but now bishop d3 is very strong. And now this uh, kind of sacrifice doesn't work, because if he does queen e5, uh, bishop f5, now if he takes on d3, then rook takes f2. So it just doesn't work. And if he takes on f3, just simply queen takes, you know, and then if like rook g1 or something, um, you know, rook f8 should be pretty crushing. Just keep the attack going. 
So because white doesn't have this this resource giving up his queen, not that it you know as much salvation on that other line, it's um, he just can't really get developed. So rook takes d3, knight takes, queen takes. There's not much else otherwise. F2 collapses, takes, bishop takes. So it doesn't look so bad. He still has three minors for the queen, but he has no development. So black plays this good move, which is the strongest. I mean, lots of moves should win, but this is the strongest. He does bishop takes c3, bc, and now queen f4. And now there's just really no sensible defense to rook f8, and he can't really get developed. He can't play knight e2, because then queen f3 would attack both of these guys. You know, he can't play rook h2. So there's just not really any kind of move. For white, you can like take on g6. It just doesn't really help. Like rook f8 is coming, and this this bishop is basically trapped. So let's say like hg hg bishop takes rook f8. There's nowhere for this uh, bishop to go. So white resign. And this game is uh, Benizi against uh, I don't even know how to say this. Looks like a mouthful. Barry Spolitz is his name. And they're both like 2,500 players. So they're both pretty good. And, you know, pretty easy day for black. He just had to follow this game. He did have to, you know, find this uh, very accurate move, bishop f5. But clearly it was a case of one player won because he knew this game, Believsky, none. And white, who was, you know, over 2,500 lost just because he wasn't familiar with that, that game. So I hope you enjoyed this miniature, and we'll see you next time on chesslecture.com.